June 1995, American fighter pilot Scott O'Grady was on routine patrol over enemy territory in Bosnia. Missile in the air, missile in the air. Missile in the air, missile in the air, buggy. Magic, Master 5 2 has just been hit. Scott O'Grady survived the missile strike, but was now drifting to Earth, miles behind enemy lines. Scott O'Grady faced the ultimate survival challenge, having to cope with the extreme conditions of war-torn Bosnia with next to no equipment, having to improvise shelter, water and food whilst evading Bosnian hunter forces. He managed to survive for five days before being rescued in a daring US military operation. In this program, I'm going to look at the training fast jet pilots are given to help them survive a situation like Scott O'Grady's. In just a few seconds, a fighter pilot can be catapulted from their jet worth millions of pounds into a Stone Age situation of surviving hand-to-mouth behind enemy lines. Here at RAF St. Morgan, fighter pilots are embarking on an intensive three-week course in combat survival and rescue. The men and women on this course are a mix of fighter pilots, navigators, and RAF helicopter personnel. Okay, you've just ejected and your seat's fallen away from that high level. Go through the drills. Okay. Between them, they've been involved in many theatres of war, including Bosnia and the Gulf, to name a few. At a moment's notice, they could find themselves at war over desert, sea, jungle, or the Arctic. That's why over three weeks, this group of RAF air crews are going to be put through an intensive course in combat survival and rescue. That means learning how to find water, how to trap wild animals, learning how to make natural shelters, and how to evade capture. Fast Jet Pilot's most important piece of survival equipment is his ejector seat. In the eventuality that he has to ditch his plane, he first pulls on this yellow and black lever here between his legs. When he does that, he sets in motion a complex sequence of events. In a matter of a few seconds, the canopy above him explodes and shatters so he won't hit it. A telescopic pole extends, and the seat and him are bodily ejected by rockets into the air. He finds himself then suspended by a small drogue parachute that stabilizes him. And when he reaches 10,000 feet, a full-size canopy deploys and the seat falls away from him, leaving him suspended with just his seat, which is also his personal survival pack. Go, 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 go. Two-thirds of the planet's surface is water, so being prepared for survival at sea is essential. Here they're experiencing what it would actually be like to be dragged by their parachute the moment after impact with the sea. Much of combat survival is dependent on learning specific drills. That way, when a crisis occurs, no one panics or hesitates. Instead, everyone follows the same well-drilled procedures. Aircraft emergency, you end up ejecting 20,000 feet. Pass through 10,000 feet, you leave the sea. First aid. Right, check canopy. Yep. Canopy's up and good. Yep. Come down, visor goes up, mask comes off. When you land in the sea, you inflate your life jacket, ditch your parachute, and get into your self-inflating life raft. Timing is critical. In some parts of the world, the water is so cold that you'll die in a matter of minutes if you don't get out. Fast jet pilots who find themselves in this position at sea are completely dependent upon rescue because there's not very much equipment can be fitted in the space under their seat. Basically, in this raft, I've got some stoppers to fix any leaks, a small pair of bellows, a day-night flare, just half a litre of water, and a packet of boiled sweets. Not a lot. So you can imagine that the most important piece of equipment, apart from this life raft, is the search and rescue beacon that sends a message via satellite to bring aid. The aircraft is sinking! Cut the painter! The painter. Helicopters and larger military planes are equipped with far more substantial survival aids. 
This raft can hold 10 people, and theoretically it would be possible to survive for months in one of these. Here they're using an osmosis pump, which desalinates seawater. You might think that once you're in the raft, your work's over, but actually it's just begun. Servicemen learn a drill to help them deal with these stressful situations. Protection, location, water and food. Protection, well, the raft provides a measure of that. Location, you've got to do things to enable yourself to be discovered and seen. Water, get the osmosis pump out, get it going, get some water on the go. And food, there's a fishing line, use that to try and catch some fish. All of these things keep you busy and improve your morale. Eight hours at sea can only give these RAF personnel a taster of what it would be like for real. But training like this has proven to save lives. Having completed the sea survival phase, the course moves on to the coastline to look at seashore survival and a whole different set of challenges. But if there's one environment that has the real potential to give you a good feed and plenty of fresh water, then it's the coastal one. The best type of survival food is that which you can pick up with your hands. And at low tide, these rocks are covered in nutritious food. Most of the group are collecting mussels, probably because that's what they're familiar with. In fact, mussels wouldn't be my first choice. I'd go for limpets because they're grazers and much less likely to concentrate poisons than mussels do, which are filter feeders. Of course, in survival, water is a much higher priority than food. Finding drinking water along the coastline can be a real challenge. Over the years, the military have developed many ingenious ways of getting water, like collecting rain from cracks in the cliff face. There's a natural fissure you can see coming down there, and there's a right line of plants that grow up above it. Having identified where the water is going to be tracking down, dig down a bit, establish a pool, and allow the water to gather there. And then with a piece of rope or something that you found on the beach that can act as a natural wick, hold it in there, wedge it in with a stone or something like that, and already you can see the water has moistened the rope, so it's just dripping off all over the place. Down here, you can see that we've filled a four-pint container just from this very small crevice here. This amount of water has been caught from that device over about 40 minutes to an hour. It's like a dripping tap. British service personnel can find themselves serving in any corner of the globe, so all of these techniques they're learning here are vitally important. When it comes to water, they learn that it's second in importance only to air. So a technique like this, turning a common army poncho into a rain trap, can make the difference between life and death. Or taking a ration pack and turning that into a distillation device in which they can heat salt water and then cool the steam into fresh drinking water. And in fact, most of these techniques, at one time or other, have actually been employed for real. The only equipment available to the students is what they would have with them in their parachute packs if they really did have to eject from their aircraft. One of the key pieces of equipment they would have with them is an axe, but some of them are struggling to use this tool properly, in this case to make feather sticks for fire lighting. Probably would be, yeah. Can I help you with that? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's not sharp enough for the job. Right. The difference that a sharp tool will, will have is considerable. Okay. Oh, I see, yeah. so, but there's a lesson there. I, mean, I know you haven't got sharpening stones at the moment, but in your kits you have them. The importance of being able to sharpen a tool and keeping it sharp can't be underestimated. 